Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, including the stuff from Champion's Path, make sure you go ahead and check out the Town store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using the code OmniPoke. For today's video, we are going over 100 games of control. Yes, my brain is absolute soup at this point. It's taken me, I think, around like 40 or so hours. Uh... To finish this goal, uh, it's it's been fun at times, but it certainly is grindy. And let me tell you, I thought there was gonna be way more scoops <laughs> on the ladder than there actually were. In my hundred games, I had seven early concedes, and I had a handful of late concedes. But honestly, when people when you set up the lock against people, people don't just concede anymore. When it, I remember when I used to play like Pidgeotto Control a lot, and even Cincino Controller as Belelbering and stuff. Um, People would just concede on you if you got like a handlock on them. Uh, but that really like never happened with Excadrill. Maybe after like 10 turns of me demonstrating the loop that I was doing the whole time, people conceded. But usually these games went like over 25 minutes uh, for the wins. For the losses, sometimes it's a little bit quicker. But yeah, this is the list that's in front of you. It's actually the exact same 60, I believe, to the list that I profiled on the channel. And... Um, Actually, that may not be correct. I think I was only playing a 1-1 Lapras for the channel video. I can't remember, but we're at a 2-2 now. Um, so yeah, very close to the channel 60 that I showed you guys. Um, and it's still my favorite way of playing Excadrill. I'll talk about why I like Lapras in a moment. But yeah, this was the 60 cards that we rocked. I played 100 games of the deck. And just like last time with ADP, we'll look over win rate. We'll look over what are the most popular decks on the ladder right now as well. Uh, it could give you some good insight if you're looking to play Players Cup 2. You can basically see the popularity of archetypes uh, currently on the ladder. This has been over the last eight days I've been playing um, these games of control. So if you've seen me on ladder recently, I've probably been playing Excadrill. I did see uh, multiple of the same name come up a few times. And oftentimes it meant that I was playing up against the same matchup. It is what it is. So this is still just a snapshot of PTCGO. You know, could have been any other week uh, or whatever. Could have run into some different matchups. And obviously that skews the results when there's only 100 games. You know, a loss is a percentage <laughs> of a win rate. So if I ran into more of a certain matchup than another, who knows, the win rate could be kind of thrown off. So this is more still towards that sort of entertainment value kind of things. But yeah, by the end of it, I'm convinced that control is okay in the meta for sure. Um, definitely has some good matchups that you like to feast on definitely some that you'd rather avoid um but after playing the 100 games there are a few cards that i could think about changing but there honestly isn't that much wiggle room for things that i want to remove from the deck list um so i'll talk about potential includes as we go through some of the wins and losses here and there because it'll become quite evident uh where things got a little bit awkward that related to a handful of my losses um, but yeah, this is the list that's in front of you just to uh, familiarize yourself with it. Not too much to say here. Uh, the Missy's Favor plus Lapras combo allows you to essentially make do slash Cynthia Caitlyn for free. Uh, when you're in the loop, oftentimes you go to zero cards, then you draw for turn. You have three cards remaining in your deck. So the loop is oftentimes Mermaids call back a Lapras, Surge Cynthia Caitlyn away the Misty. Then you draw the remaining three cards of your deck. Then you can do things like... Um, stamp JJ um, you can use your second mermaid's call the ideal board state being uh, at the end game you have Excadrill active two Cincinos, two Lapras on the board and then one other space that's usually like Luke Metal or another Drillbur or Azation that didn't die um, so the ideal setup is two, two, one drill in the active as long as you're chip chip locking of course uh, because then you get two free cards it can be uh, the Cynthia Caitlin so you go search Sinlin stamp jj chip chip uh, and then the lap the second lapras can either pay for the jj or it can then allow you to um, make do one time to um pal pad so you pal pad and then make do and draw those two cards again so you go back down to zero and then you reset that clock with drill normally you're getting uh, chip chip pal pad uh stamp and then one of the other supporters like sinlin jesse james surge that's normally the most efficient way to lock if you're going for hand removal, if they only have uh, two prize cards remaining. Two prize cards is the sweet spot. I'm not playing uh, Blow Away Bomb Wheezing, so two is is the sweet spot that we're looking for. Yes, you can hand trap people on four, but you can't loop it very easily, so uh, the loop would be different. You'd be trying to chain chip chips no matter what in that situation. 
and then you're just uh, JJing away those cards that you're um, chip chipping them, which can make things a little bit more awkward for you. So usually you'd like to sort of dice with danger and put your opponent down to two prize cards. That's the ultimate and easiest way for you to hand lock people out of the game. And that's a big win condition here. But there were plenty of other situations that come up where it doesn't get to that point. Uh, sometimes just simply looping Crushing Hammers wins you the game in a bunch of different matchups, like Eternatus being a main one, right? If you're just um, like surging Yell Grunt and... Uh, looping crushing hammers of rototilla with wondrous labyrinth in play like they're just not winning that game so uh yeah that's what it's all about uh, the luke metal being in here to full metal wall it's like the new articuno for those of you who didn't watch the control deck analysis that i did uh, a little while back um you can still power him up in a turn with the one metal one saucer so you can put this in the discard pile bench luke metal saucer to him attach one of the captures or the fightings to him um, and if you can do like surge stamp um, into Jesse James for the hand lock and then bird keeper or you can weave in your scoop up net also to move one of your one prize guys out of the active to make space for that loot metal to um, sort of jump in up front to do the GX attack. That's kind of what's going on. The rest of the deck is still like a very simple shell trying to have a fairly fix in Sino line. Um, the three two line of Excadrill did punish me two times uh, where you prize both Excadrills and you're very sad. Uh, it is a one in 50 chance, so it happening two times to me is actually like bang on, <laughs> but it's very sad when it happens. You still can be infinite because Drillbur also has Rototiller, which gets one card back, but one and four is a very, very big difference. Uh, funnily enough, I did win one game where I pri uh, prized double drill, but I lost the other one like emphatically. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, the one game I won, I think was Eternatus and I was just able to drill the back uh, like Palpad and then Sinlin uh, yell grunt enough times to still beat them anyway, <laughs> which is pretty crazy, uh, not having drill on your side. But yeah, um, outside of that, the only real like luxury cards, I guess you could say. Um, Stellar Wishing, I feel is a luxury in that it just improves your early game, but it's also like quite integral for the ADP matchup. I feel like the ADP matchup could be more heavily teched for with, for example, a second copy of Yelgrunt, um, or by having blow away bombs in your deck, the Weezings, so that you can uh, beat Intrepid Swords and keep them chip chip locked or make them not use Intrepid Sword with the threat of Weezing. Um, so that's something that you could bear in mind. My ADP matchup was negative. Um, so I think potentially more techs for that could be in order but jirachi in itself serves as a tech card because i believe the most important thing is still early game crushing hammers stop that gx is difficult because of energy switches but sometimes stopping ultimate ray is less difficult it gives you an extra turn to draw more cards an extra intrepid sword an extra couple make do's more crushing hammer hits more stellar wishes that sort of thing so um hopefully you can stop an ultimate ray at least and as long as you stop an ultimate ray you're in the game i feel um, I have won games where they have used Ultimate Ray, but it is very, very rough because they need so little and it's still a lot of you, a lot of time for you to motor through the bottom of your deck to get into a loop of cards with Excadrill, and that's kind of what you need. So, um, yeah, you could be more tech for ADP if you wanted to. Uh, nothing else is too luxury. Giratina as well st still just seems like a really good card in the format. I know ADP isn't really playing specials anymore, but Eternatus still does. Um, Mewtwo... Uh, base builds definitely do with the horrors um, a few other different archetypes as well you can definitely punish uh, Vikarom is sort of having an uptick in play and trying to deny Vikavolt spamming their attacks is really important so if you can get a Giratina hit in obviously you can't use your crushings but you can Giratina Yelgrunt and um, combine that with like Sinlins and bosses to try and buy turns of items against Vikavolt uh, that can actually be really important so the Giratina does kind of feel luxury. Um, it's kind of flexible, but I also rate him enough, and he's been very helpful in in farming Eternatus as well, just because they played captures and special darks, so that could be very useful. Um, other than that, as you move down the trainers, some potentially greedy counts. Uh, the one ordinary rod also is definitely something that lost me a couple games when you prize one it's it's so rough i think that's my least favorite card to prize outside of luke metal there are certainly some matchups you can win without luke metal but there's a handful that you literally can't win if you prize luke metal um so uh i think the one of luke metal and the one of ordinary rod would definitely be the first two cards that i'd look to make a second copy of in the deck 
Um, outside of that, an extra scoop up net is also uh, very helpful just to get you into early game Jirachis more often. Sometimes you can do like a make do dance where you made multiple Mincinos but only found one Cincino in a similar vein. You could thicken this line, you could play an extra com here or there. Like, I'm not telling you the cuts, I'm just kind of telling you what you'd like in this list as we just randomly disconnect and we'll get back into this. Um, but yeah, it's it's a straightforward lock your hand, for, lock your opponent's hand, try and get into that zero card deck loop where you're just getting things back over and over again. Um, if you want to see some Excadrill gameplay, I have done some on the channel. I even faced uh, Ross in the OP, OP League with Excadrill as well, so even more recent gameplay with this exact 60 as well. Um, so yeah, outside of that, key components. Um, Gala Mines and Wondrous Labs, I think these are definitely the right stadiums to be playing. Um, not much else to say on the list. Uh, also, energy cards can sometimes be a pain. Uh, the two captures are definitely very good. I had a 6% higher win rate going first than going second, and I would always choose to go first. Part of the reason being that you play two Zation, four Quick Ball, two Com, and two captures. Those captures could be better served as an extra fighting or an extra metal energy, but then you have to choose to go second, and you do lose percentage points. Uh, for the most part, uh, when you are going second. And bear in mind, um, that win rate is higher going first, even though Center Scorch is your hardest matchup, and Center Scorch often makes you go first, So uh, because Senti loves to go second if it's the greens base build or it's the welder base build. Either way, they're choosing second most of the time, so Center Scorch being the worst matchup kind of makes that percentage look closer than it is, but your win rate is actually a lot higher, I would say. Um, going first in almost every situation so yeah i think uh that's my main thought process around that but yeah that's the list let's jump over to the spreadsheet where we can talk more in depth about these numbers i'm going to zoom in first on the uh wins and losses and stuff that's what most people care about so the overall uh record was 67 wins and 33 losses coming in and obviously 67% win rate, less than ADP, which was 73% win rate. So um, the long story short is ADP is better than control <laughs> in our little experiment that we've had. Um, I also did the data slightly differently to last time. I, uh, whoops, it's not really playing very well with here, uh, but this time I just put the decks in order strictly of how many I played against Whereas against uh, with uh, the first data set, I put the highest number of wins down to the highest number of losses, if that makes sense, uh, with the ADP side. This time, I've just gone for which deck I played against the most at the top. And that was ADP. I put that in orange because it is a slightly negative matchup. Now, interestingly, the more, the, the later I got in the ladder, the worst my ADP win rate was. Um, which is strange because normally you'd expect a small uptick in wins towards the latter stages as I got more comfortable with the deck. Uh, and before I did this 100 games, I had played 25 games with Excadrill Control, so I'd, I was somewhat comfortable with the 60. Um, interestingly, I lost her only one timeout in the 100 games, so uh, it's kind of a myth that you don't have enough time to win with this deck. Uh, but there is the caveat that I did win a few of my matchups by actually taking prize cards because by the time I had established the lock, um, I saw that the clock was basically less than like 12 minutes and then you feel like there's not enough time. I typically found I could mill two cards per minute <laughs> for all the actions that are being played on PTCGO and my boomer APM. Um, so I always would establish my lock and immediately look, look down at the uh, timer at the bottom to see if I had, you know, like 15 minutes to mill 30 cards, I'd go for the mill approach. Otherwise, I'd try and go for an attacking approach. You can only really go for an attacking approach if you have both chip chips, by the way. Otherwise, you are just soft locking and it's really hard for you. So there are situations where you're not really comfortably able to go for an attacking approach unless you know you've run them out of energies. So do bear that in mind. Or if you've run them out of like switch outs and you've trapped something, you know. So, uh, yeah, ADP, slightly negative. Um, I think some of our later losses, there was some RNG involved. Um, obviously, there's a lot of RNG in all sorts of situations, but our lower losses against uh, ADP definitely felt rough. Um, I remember, uh, so against <laughs> a center scorch, we prized double drill. Um, we definitely had like triple a triple tails game um, post-GX attack where we have a chance. Um, basically, 
Um, this is a Hammer's Go Burr deck, and it, it's mostly against ADP where early game Hammers are like super integral. The game can, they can just get carried away with the game because they play Elder Gulls double Marnie most times, sometimes a few more, unless it's a clay DP list, which kind of popped up and actually helped our win rate, to be honest. Um, but with the Marnies and stuff, it, it's a lot of pressure. So you really, really need to have early game yell grunts and hammers on your side um to be able to win that so the hammers are most important against adp i think um so that's something to bear in mind um you basically farm eternatus my only losses to eternatus were poison based builds i still beat a number of the poison based builds um but it was certain situations where i didn't have enough energies to kill their garbador so their poison was sticking the entire game and the other situation was where i prized a bird keeper and a scoop up net uh, so I couldn't get around poison very easily. Uh, so I was actually like giving up prize cards in between turns, which made life obviously very difficult for me. So um, yeah, I feel like this deck farms a turn of pretty hard. Poison can be a harder matchup legitimately though, because naturally they play so many switch outs as well. Typically they're playing uh, like a high count of dark city and high switch count and sometimes even special dark on top of that. And they don't need to commit their energies to attacking with Eternatus as long as they make enough Toxic Rokes. So then it's just trying to beat out their switch options, to be honest. But um, Eternatus is something that you basically farm. Whenever I saw an Eternatus, they were some of the fastest wins I had because you don't even need to establish an, a lock against them. You just can straight up run them out of energy, trap their Eternatus VMAXs if ever they're making them. That's that's a thing. Center Scorches definitely seem to be the hardest matchups. Um, I took some wins against both, uh, but realistically, you should never beat Green Center Scorch. If you're playing Green Center Scorch into control, here's a quick tip. Don't blow up your Magneton. Just chill. Just leave a Magneton on the board, and they basically have no win condition against you as the control player. Because they can't ever handlock you, and you only need two energy for Center Scorch. It self-accelerates, so like... If your board state is just Magneton Center Scorch, you can't lose. <laughs> like, you literally cannot lose the game. If you're a regular Center Scorch, you can lose the game a little bit more because they will try to Jesse James stamp Luke Metal and then Chip Chip lock you. Uh, that happened a few times, uh, but ultimately the pressure that Center Scorch push puts on you so early is just really gross to deal with. It feels very similar to ADP in that you're just staring down so much pressure a lot of my losses against Center Scorch came down to them going like turn one flare starter into like turn two boss zation, turn three boss zation. And it's like you've come up against ADP basically because they're just a couple KOs away. And that's uh, really, really ugly from the outset. So Center Scorch decks and ADP decks make you draw very, very well. Against other stuff, you have a lot more leeway, a lot more time to do whatever you want really. Um, because most decks are busy setting up and leaving your Zations and stuff in the back, whereas Senti and ADP really... Uh, well, a ADP doesn't really touch the Zation too often unless they're going for game on it, um, but uh, the Senti Scorch deck definitely disrupts your engine quite a bit because a lot of Sentis are playing 1-2 to two Elder Goss and a couple Boss and Poker Gears, and those Poker Gears actually help them get there like quite often. So, yeah, the Senti is definitely felt like the roughest matchup, and the stats prove that. Um... Well, the Mewtwo was surprisingly easy for us. Um, I think if they play with their Victini V more carefully, this should have been harder. I feel like I could have taken L's to Mewtwo here and there. Obviously, I'm not playing Power Plant or anything like that. Um, so I think you can tech more for Mewtwo if you found difficulty with it. Uh, and the matchup may be getting harder if Incineroar comes into their list as well, because that can be a means of accelerating to multiple threats. So you can't just loot metal and chill. So... Um, that could be something to be concerned about. But right now, the 7-0 felt like um, not necessarily a high roll, but it definitely flatters control. I feel like Mewtwo certainly can win if they time their stamps well alongside the right knockouts. You can try and use um, Naganadel aggressively if you want to as well. I believe it's worth it to Naganadel aggressively just to knock out Cincinos because you're hurting their engine. If you can be bossing Zations, I do still like feel like it's worth it quite often, especially if you can combine it with a stamp. Um, so... Yeah, Mewtwo can be tricky. I just uh, was able to take wins against all of them. Luke Metal definitely feels like a super free matchup. They have a lot of chonky stuff that you can trap. Um, so that's not a big problem. You're not too concerned that they can Intrepid Sword throughout the game because they just put on so uh, like not enough pressure that ADP does. Vikavolt uh, with Picarom definitely felt tricky as well at times. Um, you're basically trying to Sinlin back bosses and um, try and use the Giratina plus Yelgrunt combo to buy yourself 
turns off of item lock. Whenever you're off of item lock, you can really go nuts on them and uh, very much punish their board state. Um, so trying to be aware of that. Obviously, you have to be aware that you basically play the game without power pads and without um, super rods. So you have to be quite de uh, quite defensive with your excadrills and be very aware of those counts. Um, but I think that matchup's fine. Inteleon as well. I actually think this is kind of a flattering score as well that we had against them. I did take some L's to some other Inteleon matchups. I lost to one Inteleon Hammers and one Inteleon Omastar. The Inteleon Omastar matchup was by far my favorite game of the 100. Uh, I, I wish I'd recorded it because that was honestly like such a fun game. Uh, they played four scoop-up nets and four switches, and they were trying to lock out Omastar on me so I couldn't item use and I was trying to uh, surge boss Sinlin that sort of stuff against them and it was it was super fun I think it came down to me like flipping two tails on crushing hammers um, but there was all sorts going on like they were even using like tickle on Omanite it was it was really really fun that series uh, so yeah uh, we have taken some L's against Inteleon just not the regular Inteleon Frostmoth build um, but their 60 damage prods are worrying at times they do play like balloons and stuff as well so they do have some freedom of movement they have a one energy attack option uh, and at the same time that one energy attack puts an energy back into your hand so it's hard for you to place wondrous labyrinth down because they're picking up your energies at the same time so you need to labyrinth on a turn that you don't want to recycle things so quite a lot of nuance in this matchup um, oftentimes it comes down to luke metal doing bits to win me the game uh, that's where most of the dubs come from. You just loot metal, chip, chip. But obviously their sniping pressure can be worrying because they're targeting your engine more often than not. The Baby Blown's loss was due to a donk. I think this should basically always be a win. Uh, Welderbox, um, like I was saying with the Mewtwo, if Welderbox plays cleverly with their uh, Victini V, it can actually be a fairly rough matchup. It's, it acts very similarly to the Center Scorch build. So I again think this was a pleasant surprise that we were able to beat as many as we did. Uh, Desi Goons should be free. Mad Party, it's very difficult for them to win it as long as you can trap things. Uh, oftentimes they don't play many counter stadiums to your Gala Mines. Like sometimes it's like one swell, sometimes it's nothing. Uh, you can beat that quite easily, I would say. Um, other things that we didn't really play much against. Obviously these are like lesser decks that we don't need to worry about too much. I lost to an ADP Dreadnought, <laughs> which was quite sad. Uh, what else did I lose to? Uh, I lost... A 1-1-2, one, one, a um, Frostmoth Mewtwo. I think that's a lot more tricky than uh, the Welder Mewtwo base build because they have Starmie. So you have to try and nuke metal them, chip chip them, and then like immediately drop a Wondrous Labyrinth on them or make sure you have both chip chips available uh, to deny Starmie for the entire game. And that's not always easy. Um... Salamance, the loss to Salamance involved five of five coin flip tails. I feel like that matchup should be much easier, but they were able to start doing the big 30 damage spread plays as well as um, the double twin slice snipe, whatever it is. Uh, so that loss felt really bad. I don't think the matchup's bad, though, unless they are playing Porygon Recycles. If they play Porygon Recycles, you should always lose the game, I think, as long as they just keep one energy onto the active and they're playing around stamp for a long period uh, and they play towards just doing a 30 spread around your entire board you should lose the game right because they're just flinging the 40s around you can't hand lock them um, and you can't remove the energies uh, and then they can just set up a big 30 damage swing to take like you know like a four prize five prize kind of turn um, and that can be gross like yes you have scoop up net to try and offset that sort of stuff but it's a slow grind that you'll eventually lose i would think um so yeah the the salamance the matchup is good but we took an l um not much else to say we shouldn't really be able to beat sandaconda colossal that should be a very difficult matchup um they just got overzealous early game um trying to pressurize us and they ended up um committing too energy too many energies to their board that they didn't have enough to then put onto their colossals to retreat because uh, they actually set up double colossal against me um so I forced four energies onto one Colossal, brought up the other one, and they had, like, too many energies on, like, a Ninetales, a Colossal, and a Sandaconda, and it's like, they they run themselves out. Um, what else? Straight Vika Vault, easier than Vika Rom, because the peak Rom can be extra burst acceleration, and it can be threat... Like, if they're just smacking with Vika Vault into the active and building up peak Rom on the bench, that's super scary, because they can then take, you know, two uh, prize knockouts towards the latter stages that you can't really defend against too easily. 
Um, so that's something to be aware of. I think the Pika Rom side makes it harder than Beak of Old playing like hammers and other disruption cards because you're kind of immune to those uh, because you're trying to do so little and they're still just doing 50 a turn into your drills, so that's fine. Uh, like I said, the win rate was slightly higher going first, and like I said as well, our hardest matchup is Center Scorch, um, I would say. And um, your and Center Scorch chooses to go second all the time, and still your win rate's higher. So you could think that this win rate would be higher still um, if you were just like taking the L to the Center Scorch matchup and uh, not putting them into your going first versus going second calculations. So yeah, that kind of leads me on to how we ended up losing some games and how we uh, took some wins. You can see I highlighted in yellow the scoops. There were seven in total. All of the scoops were um, favorable matchups, except exactly this one uh, that was ADP, and that was down to just early game hammer spam, and they missed like early game attachments. The rest were matchups I considered to be very good. Desi Goons, Luke Metal, Baby Blounds, um, Eternatus, all good things that you'd expect to beat. So I'm imagining that most people saw what I was playing and um, knew the matchup was very bad and didn't want to sit there for 20 minutes, which is super duper fair and I appreciate it. I thought about um, playing an extra seven games to make up for the scoops, but honestly, I played like so much control and I want to get Champions Path content out. So excuse the fact that I've only got 93 games here. Uh, I would take it as winning the matchup roulette a couple times over on the ladder. Couple L's that uh, were pretty awkward um, for me. Um, I think the biggest thing was prizing a Luke Metal leads to a lot of losses in certain matchups. It makes your ADP far more difficult. I think um, it makes your Center Scorch auto loss. Um, it also makes Mewtwo very, very difficult if, if Luke Metal is not available. So um, I think playing a second copy of Luke Metal is certainly reasonable. I think Super Odd is another thing that I hated prizing. Uh, sometimes you have to weave in Rototillers from Drillbuzz just to put back like a fighting energy here or there or something like that. So whenever I would prize a Drill plus a Rod or a Rod plus a Fighting, you felt really, really bad. So I could think about adding in an extra Capture or an extra Fighting Energy, sorry, an extra Fighting or an extra Super Rod like quite a lot. Um, and if you are worried about that 1 in 50 of Double Drill being prized, you can play a third copy as well. Playing the third copy of Extra Drill is actually quite beneficial for the Eternatus matchup, which I know is very good. Uh, but um, it just means in matchups where you're trying to loop crushings, also to an extent ADP, it just means that if you have access to that like that third fighting or that third Extra Drill, you get him online that much quicker, so you get to loop cards much quicker. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. Other than that, more consistency cards, more comms, more Cincinos if you really want to. Blow Away Bomb, Weezing. I'll just go ahead and jump back to PCGO to show you the card that I'm talking about. Um, is the thing that you use alongside um, JJ to discard... Is it Blow Away Bomb? No, it's Surrender now. Uh, when you discard this guy, um, this forces an extra discard from the opponent. So Jesse Jamesing for three cards uh, can be a great way for you to continue to lock out um, Intrepid Swords. So if you want to improve your ADP win rate, I think Weezing is the guy. And to be honest, ADP is an important enough matchup to where I, I realistically probably should be playing a Weezing in this list, to be honest. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if my win rate would change too much against the ADP matchup. Maybe I should play an extra like five games against ADP against Jack or something uh, where I'm playing Weezing. So you can offset those Intrepid Swords and maybe make the opponent not Intrepid Sword even in situations. But at the same time, ADP often plays a Rangaroo. So I'm not sure how strong the Weezing is in the first place. As long as ADP is smart and puts a Rangaroo down, um, you're still in a lot of worry because you can't chip chip lock them. So the Intrepid Sword is only like one part of the equation, right? Um, you could also think about having some additional proactive supporters. I didn't find this like too horrific but there were definitely some situations where it feels really bad when you haven't set up at a Cincino yet and you're getting Marnied and that sort of stuff uh, having Lapras and Misty really helps out in that situation because you can at least um, guarantee a supporter use for that turn and that supporter use is getting you back into Surge Sinlin plus like Bird Keeper or plus Boss or whatever um, so it puts you back on track but it's not very proactive really so having like even if it's just one copy of Research Hapu Clay Bill like I honestly think one copy is sometimes just enough because it's something you can stellar wish towards it's something that you can um, just have in hand as an out against Marnie and it's something you can obviously um, make do into at any point so 
having a bit of a bit more uh, robust situations against um, Marnies and Stamps definitely is appealing to me. Um, for the same reason, Poker Gear could be very interesting as well in the list. Um, just because of how few useful supporters you have in the early turns, it's literally like just Sinlin, Birdkeeper, and Misty as like good proactive supporters that get you towards things right now. And that's really not a lot. So having a poker gear that could help you in the early turns find one of those key pieces that we play six total of, um, or just digging towards like surge could be like really helpful as well. So poker gear, if you're not happy with happy research or clay, obviously there are downsides to all three of those because sometimes you can just um, discard things like wondrous labyrinth. You can discard one energy too many or whatever else. Uh, it makes you have to play differently with your hand. Uh, because you're not sure or you don't really know what's going to be the outcome of clay or hapu you know the outcome of research but there are situations where you've drawn pieces that makes you not have to research uh, whereas bill is kind of like less aggro dig um so he's not all that helpful but he could be uh very helpful for helping you pick out hammers in the early turns that's kind of why i wanted to mention him because again it could be a card considered to help that uh, adp matchup just because he can pick out hammers by the same merit, it could be an extra yell grunt, but Bill has the has the upside of helping you not like lose in the opening turns to donks or just uh, even like even if you don't get donk with this deck, you hate just like Mincino's dying and stuff like that. So um, having Bill to just get you more quick balls and comms to actually get towards Mincino's faster and get replacement basics that you can just throw into the active. Like Lapras and Drillbers are perfect to throw into the active in the opening turns. Uh, just to allow your Zacian and your Cincinos and Mincinos to have like safe passage on the bench for a little bit. So yeah, I think Bill could be a useful card out of those four options. Uh, Cheer Yell Horn, not seen too much, but we play, you know, Scoop Up Net and Double um, Bird Keeper. So it's something you could weave in. Um, I feel like it could be helpful against ADP, especially because boss trapping is oftentimes a win con, uh, especially if they go aggressive looking for energy switch combos in situations. Either they've gone second and they're just trying to ultimate ray on turn on their first turn um or if they've like missed an attachment or if you hammered away an energy sometimes they just start going research to dene to go ham to then hit attachment plus e-switch plus saucer so having cheer yell horn in there as well to maybe force some extra switches out of them could be a definite big help because sometimes it's just like trying to drop gala mine bring up a crowbat or a dene that they've played uh can sometimes be your win condition late on so do bear that in mind Lily's Polka Doll, I've mentioned how the aggression of ADP and Center Scorch can sometimes be very, very detrimental. Crossing your fingers with a doll isn't the worst idea in the world, um, just to give yourself that extra turn. Um, you know, an extra turn is sometimes like seven to ten cards because you're intrepid sorting, making do, sin linning, all that sort of stuff. So uh, to be fair, the Yellhorn or the Polka Doll could be useful for that uh, aspect. I think I would always play a second copy of Scoop Up Net before I played U-Turn Board. Um, but it's something that I've seen mentioned a few times and it can give you a bit of leeway. Uh, it can get you into um, your Jirachis a little bit easier. It's like an extra attachment in many ways. Um, it can just help. It can it forces you to not have to Bird Keeper on the turn that you Luke Metal, <clears throat> which actually means you can make more... There are more routes for you to make the Luke Metal in the first place because you can... Uh, you don't have to weave in the Bird Keeper, so you can do things like Surge Misties and then use like Rosa to get Energy Luke Metal uh, Saucer. So it kind of helps out in those situations because it's kind of already on the board, so you're not worried about uh, Marnies. Uh, so it's one less combo piece. That's kind of the only real upside to playing a second Scoop Up Net, but in general I think Net's probably better. Uh, tool Scrapper as well. I was really not punished by Balloons too much because Gallamine offsets Balloon anyways, Gives you a bit of breathing room though, and it makes your chip chips um, safer. You can give your opponent an energy here and there. Um, so it's something you can think about, but it's not high on my priority list. Overall, controls, main weaknesses. Obviously, prizing combo pieces was my biggest means of losing, actually. Um, I felt uh, so there were situations where I prized double chip chip, double stamp, double excadrill. They're one in 50s, so you sort of take them on the chin, but. In the 100 games, because you play so many two-ofs, it's happened to me like five times or so. And the 1 in 10 of the Luke Metal is definitely a big feels bad when you do your opening search and you, you're up against Center Scorch. There was literally times where I was like, yeah, I basically can't win unless I do like Yell Grunt, Hammerheads, Hammerheads, Hammerheads uh, to then 
force them to at least have a welder. And it's like, of course they have welder because they play for Gears and Elder Goss anyway. So, uh, yeah, that's really rough. Magneton and even things like Cincino, Orangaroo, those sorts of cards uh, really are horrific because you can't uh, sustain a good lock against people. Marnie as well in general, Marnie, Stamp, those sorts of cards. They are a headache. Yes, you have make dues. Yes, you have Intrepid Swords, but sometimes it's just an anti-tempo from you. It, it can disrupt your combo if they're going down to two prizes, and that's how you can lose the game sometimes. Even just them going to one prize uh, can be enough for you to lose the game because then you're only able to stamp JJ one card away, and that's when the timer really starts to eat away at you. Um, so... Yeah, I, I think those cards are still obviously detrimental. These really aren't things that you should be unaware of. You should already kind of get the gist around control. Um, it's really cool to see that this sort of archetype can still be viable, though. Uh, based on the win rate and the fact that it's got a decent Eternatus makes me think that it's around that sort of tier 2 kind of range. Um, I think it's it feasts against a lot of random stuff as well, which is like a really good benefit, actually. And having like a close to 50, 50, 50 ADP is like as good as any deck can hope for. Because if we go back to our ADP um, sort of like matchup spread, it was only really Welder, Mewtwo. It was only really the Mewtwo decks that had positive ADP. Everything else ADP was like able to consistently beat as much as it would lose to at the very least, right? So um, any deck that can go close to 50, 50 against ADP is like good in my books. Uh, so having a very good Eternatus, an okay ADP, an and like a bad but winnable center scorch outside of greens and then you beat pretty much everything random is like it's a really good there's like a lot of brownie points there so i, I think solidly tier two um if a little bit nervous about the adp like i don't feel comfortable going into the adp matchups it was always a, it was always a grind you were never really in complete control because a Rangaroo can do things and because Intrepid Sword's there, you know. Uh, so there's definitely ways you can lose uh, outside of just like running them out of stuff and then you then you know you've got them, right? If you know that they're out of switches or if you know they're out of like waters and you've trapped ADP, those sorts of things, you know when you get there. And if you, like, there were games where I just made, like, I stopped the GX from ever happening, you know. If I was able to find Crushing Hammers and Wondrous Labyrinth early and it just kind of stuck... Um, there were some hilarious games against Clay DP where they were discarding their own waters. <laughs> that, that was sometimes pretty good. So the Clay matchup is actually quite beneficial for you. I know some Clay DPs also play Super Rod to try and offset that. So yeah, something to bear in mind. But yeah, that is my Excadrill Escapade. Uh, it took way longer than I expected. I'm glad that I got the grind out of the way because now every other time I do this series with any other deck, uh, it's going to feel like a lot less effort. So yeah, another very strong deck. Um, one final look at the list. Let me know what you guys think about Control. Have you been playing it any other way? I know the Sylvalli base, uh, base build was one that I've seen Tord using quite a lot. Um, but I think I've made my stance like pretty clear on me liking Lapras because it's an extra good early game supporter card for you. Um, and it's like free make do's to help your loop um, be very, very efficient card-wise which means you can basically get away with doing the... Like, you only really have a break in uh, your lock whilst doing stamp removal, uh, like, once every, like, five turns, because your deficit is only, like, one card at a time. Uh, and towards the late game, you sometimes have, like, excess drillbers, excess uh, Cincinos, Mincinos, excess Zations, like, excess Quick Balls, Comms. You have a lot of excess cards, and as long as you know what their top deck is, you don't have to play around stuff. So you can just, like, throw away your Bird Keepers, throw away your bosses, knowing that they can't do anything. Um, and every, like, fifth turn or something, it's like, okay, I'll just chip-chip this turn. I won't stamp JJ them. I'll get some cards back into my deck, like Super Rod and Power Pad, uh, and those other cards that I threw away earlier to uh, make sure that I'm not going to be punished by this stuff. And uh, because Ordinary Rod can sometimes get you back four cards, uh, you then, you know, uh, are going plus three. Uh, to help you then start minusing again for your own JJ. So, yeah, I really like the Lapras, <laughs> long story short. Also, it's extra basics for you to start that aren't Mincinos and Zations, uh, which is good news. And it's a one retreat cost Pokemon, so it gets you into Jirachi, so it's better than a drill to start. So, yeah, a lot of discussion there. I'm out of breath. I have been because I've been kind of passionate about control because I've, you know, learned it inside and out, basically, at this point. Um... Champion's Path doesn't really change uh, Excadrill Control too much. Uh, you enjoy any Altaria matchup that comes around. You actually are very scared of Frostmoth Werelord. 
uh, because Werelord has one energy attack that recovers three energy from the discard pile. So that feels very similar to um, Mewtwo Frostmoth. Um, so I feel like the matchup will be very similar there. Uh, the good news being that it takes all four energies um, to actually attack with their Werelord. And even then they have to flip coins. Uh, so that's a small upside, uh, I guess. Uh, and they also have fat retreat costs. So if they overbench, you can definitely punish that. But um, yeah, I think that's a slightly awkward matchup. Incineroar could be going into Welder decks that could be awkward as well. So a couple awkward cards for control, but nothing that makes me think it's going to uh, completely lose steam and no longer be viable. So... Let me know what you guys think about Control. Let me also know what deck you want to see next on the 100 games of series. Um, there's obviously Eternatus. There's new Champions Path decks that I might give a go. There's updated Mewtwo now with potentially Incineroar that you can toy around with. I'll hear it in the discussion down below. Let me know what you guys think of the video. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in another one tomorrow. Cheers.